My name is Ben Walker. I'm one of the two co-chairs of City Circle. And on behalf of the charity, I'm really delighted to be able to welcome you here to St. Ethelberger's Centre for Peace and Reconciliation um, for tonight's um, concert for Srebrenica, um, which has been organised as part of uh, Srebrenica Memorial Week. Um, this is the week that 24 years ago um, a genocide began to take place at the village of Srebrenica in eastern Bosnia during the war during 1995. <coughs> and it was a systematic attempt to wipe out the Muslim population of Bosnia. Um, it was the only genocide to take place in Europe since the Second World War. And it was planned and ordered at the highest levels um, of both the political and military leadership of the Bosnian Serbs at the time during the war. Three years ago, I and other people from the City Circle team went on a delegation with the charity Remembering Srebrenica to learn about the genocide, to learn about the war, to learn about how it came about in Bosnia, and also to learn and hear from the survivors and the people who lost their loved ones and families in Srebrenica. When we came back, I and other people who went on our delegation pledged to raise awareness of what had happened to pass on the message from the survivors and the people that we'd met. Um, and tonight is, I'm pleased to say, the, the third continuation of that. We've been running these events ever since. Um, the idea being that although not all of you will have had the opportunity to go to Bosnia and not all of you will have had a chance to go through that learning experience yourselves, hopefully we can pass on some of what we, we learned and we experienced during, uh, during those visits. And so through music and survivor testimony tonight, um, we, hope to, we hope to keep alive the spirits uh, of the people that we've met um, and to keep their memory alive and to, to learn the lessons for many years to come. The event tonight is a partnership, as you see, with the organisation Remembering Srebrenica, uh, which is a charity set up specifically to commemorate the genocide in Bosnia. Um, and so, to tell us a little bit more about the organisation, I'm going to hand over now to Amil Khan, who's the Director of Remembering Srebrenica. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks to uh, Ben. Um, to just pick up on what he said, actually, uh, before I go into greater detail about our, what our organisation does, is that this week we do reflect what happened in Srebrenica 24 years ago. And after the Holocaust, we said, never again. Yet, I think the more accurate mantra to describe what's happened subsequently is yet again, because the sad reality is that genocide has taken place in different continents in different decades since 1945, with Srebrenica being the worst atrocity on European soil since the Holocaust. Um, the organisation for which I'm the director was created in 2013, and in essence, it was to ensure that uh, what happened in Srebrenica was actually brought to communities here in the UK through educating them. Prior to 2013, there was very little awareness, there was very little events. I remember speaking to a member of the Bosnian community in my home city of Birmingham, and he said the number of events that used to be held, you could count on the fingers of one hand, the number of people who used to go there were sort of in single figures, many of whom actually weren't from, was actually from the Bosnian community. Um, and since our organisation has been created, I'm really proud to say that we've organised close to 6,500 memorial activities and events right across the country. Uh, we've educated 90,000 young people on the lessons from Srebrenica and created over 1,300 people, individuals like Ben and many others who are here today, who've gone to Bosnia themselves to witness firsthand what happened and subsequently come back and use their pledges to tackle hatred and intolerance in their communities. Am um, I really proud to say that this week um, we've organised over a thousand memorial activities and events and none of them would have been possible without the tireless dedication and commitment like people like Ben and Ramiz and the board chairs. So I just wanted to express our heartfelt gratitude. We've had events across schools, places of worship, churches, synagogues, mosques, so many local authorities. I think this year we've had another number of record-breaking a uh, number of authorities have actually organised an act of commemoration with this raising a flag, holding a minute's silence, um, raising it at their full council. Um, we've had so many schools integrate into their lesson packs and teach their pupils about what happened. So it's been truly overwhelming to see such the, the impact that um, Memorial Week has had. Um, whilst we look back 
at moments like this to commemorate and honour the victims of the genocide. We must also reflect on what's happening today and look forward. Uh, the sad reality is, if you look at what's happening, particularly in the last year, the climate in the sense of genocide denial is becoming more prevalent. There are people in positions of responsibility who deny that genocide took place, which hurts so many of those who've already had to suffer so much. If you look at our own communities here in the UK, it's worrying to see the number of incidents in relation to hate crime, but particularly religious hate crime. And in actual fact, since I first started working for Remembering Shunnits four years ago, you can detect the palpable divisions that exist. You can see the deterioration in the level of tolerance that we used to pride ourselves on being able to say that we were quite proud of. So therefore, whilst we, you know, the work of Remembering Shunnits is, you know, has never been more important. Um, I therefore just want to finish to once again like thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here.
joined by uh, Sid Bin Masichin. And he was 18 years old, um, living in a village in, um, I think it's pronounced, uh, Karako, Karako? Uh, <laughs> um, in northern Bosnia, um, in the region of Priador, um, in 1992, when the war began. And when the Bosnian Serb army arrived in his village, um, they systematically burnt down homes and began to massacre the population there. Sid Bin um, managed to escape the initial killings and was taken to possibly what might have turned out to be an even worse fate. He was taken to the notorious concentration camp, um, I think it's pronounced um, uh, Trinopoli, um, in, in northern Bosnia. These, these camps have been set up systematically by the Bosnian Serb army and political leadership to bring about the extermination of the Bosnian Muslim and Muslim Croat population who were living in the region that the Bosnian Serbs wanted to carve out and to be a new Greater Serbia within Bosnia. That might have, of course, have been the end of Sabin's story. But there were, in 1992 in the summer, there were ITN journalists who made it to the concentration camps. And I'm just about old enough to remember some of the reports that came out in August, um, which really shocked the world. We saw men for the first time emaciated in the same way as people had been uh, found in Auschwitz um, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the Holocaust. And so tonight, um, thankfully, he did manage to escape from, from that terrible situation, and tonight we're honoured to be able to host him here in London. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, brothers and sisters, my name is Sudbin Music, and I come from Priedor, a town in northwest Bosnia, which in the summer 1992 became a paradise of the suffering of the civilians on the foundations of the former Yugoslavia and Bosnia and Herzegovina in general. Uh, and on the 5th of August 1992, with thanks to British journalists Roy Gatman, Penny Marshall, Ed Williams, and Jan Williams, the most notorious concentration camps in Europe after the Second World War uh, were uncovered. They would ultimately save thousands of our, of our lives. The world learned what it was that, what, uh, that was happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Unfortunately, Prieto is just the beginning of that, which would conclude in 1995 as genocide in UN safe zones of Srebrenica and Jericho. I will briefly share with you my personal story, but before I begin, I wish to give thanks to the organizers of this commemoration and the charity Remembering Srebrenica and all that are part of this organization, especially Dr. Bakar Asmi. In the... Okay. In the name uh, of all the victims and survivors of the genocide in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I wish to take this opportunity on behalf of the surviving detainees of, con of concentration camps of Omarska, Keraterm and Trnopole to say thank you to the heroic reporters heroic British reporters whose entry, photographs, recordings and newspaper articles alarmed the world and saved numerous of lives in Prieto area. I want to express also my gratitude to the people and government of the United Kingdom for all the help, support and solidarity shown to my country over the years and without which I would not be speaking to you here today. I was born and grew up in the suburbia, suburban areas of Piedor called Zetsovi and Charakovo. I come from a modest working family of which I am the eldest of four children. I turned 18 on the 8th of May 1992. Just a few days earlier, Piedor has been declared as a part of the Serbian Autonomous District of Bosnia and Herzegovina 
and the first democratically elected government of my city was forcibly removed from its office. And I will never forget my last school class at school and uh, the final words of my high school teacher when he said, see you in the next school years, in the, in the next school year, but those who survive. The end of the school year was, in fact, the beginning of the end of our community that even today is still trying to survive. Soon after school finished, the first incident will take place, destruction of the neighborhood villages of Hambarine, then Kozarats, and eventually the city center of Prieto. And all this time I kept wondering and asking myself where everyone from those areas had gone. Prieto at the time was the sixth largest municipality in Bosnia and Herzegovina. On 30th of May 1992, we were ordered as a sign of loyalty to the new Serbian authorities in Prijedor to hang a white sheet from our houses and when we left our homes we were required to wear armbands, white armbands. That, uh, that was the first time after the Second World War that a group due their ethnicity would once again be physically marked. For the, uh, <coughs> my father, together with all known Serbs, lost their jobs and his director at the time physically also slapped him. And that's when Charakovo continued to live in complete isolation from the world, waiting all this summer in terror and constant attacks for something unknown to be happening. On Monday, the 20th of July 1992, in the evening, we noticed a number of young people running through our streets from, neighbor, from, from the nearby villages of Hambarine, Rakovčani, Rizvanovici and Bishchen. They told us that hundreds of people were being killed, raped and that the rivers were running with blood. My father couldn't believe what he was hearing. He didn't believe it to be true. Yet three days later on Thursday, the 23rd of July 1992, he was shot by Kalashnikov gun of the former Yugoslav people army. That morning he wasn't with us. He was cutting grass in the fields together with his friends. And at the same time the Serbian army together with police entered my village of Setsovi and Čarako. When they arrived to our house, I had no idea what was going to happen. I feared for my mom, my younger brother, and my two younger sisters. That fear, I still feel even today. The soldier took my brother and I, who brother was just 16 at the time, they beat us. I remember trying to grab my brother from the soldier to try to protect him. After they beat us, they took us to the Sana River Bank, a place where I spent my best childhood years to be executed. I saw the remains and dead bodies of my neighbors who had been killed before me. I saw how their bodies were flooding downstream, hitting into rocks as they went. When it was my turn to be shot, I began praying and begged God for it all to happen quickly. And then I heard someone screaming. It was the bus driver driving people to the concentration camps and my father's war colleague, a Serbian. He saved us that day. He was crying and pointed with his hand to get onto, he, onto his bus. And then we were being transported to the, to the Ternopoli concentration camp in the same buses we used to get to the school. When I arrived to Ternobole, I finally had the answer to my question of where everyone had disappeared to. In Ternobole, I finally understood what my high school teacher had meant with his departing words on our last school day. My brother and I were in despair alone in Ternobole. We didn't know where anyone was in a huge crowd of men, women and children who were all hungry, thirsty, and dirty. I will never forget the 
eyes of the children in Trinopole, children that didn't dare cry because of their fear. Whilst we were in the concentration camp, Elvisa, my old school friend, had told me that my father had been killed. She told me his last words in hope of mercy were, why are you doing this? I have four children. Who is going to feed them? A few days later, my mom and sisters were also brought to the concentration camp. And I will never forget the moment I was reunited with them. After that, for days, we tried to join one of the deportation convoys leaving the camp together, even to we had no idea where we would end up. And one day, we were lucky enough to be able to be deported <coughs> together. After several days of, after several, several, several years of wandering migrant routes through Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and then Slovakia, and then Germany, we eventually returned to, to Bosnia after the war. My younger brother did not want to return. He couldn't because of traumas he endured. Today he lives in Chicago in the United States of America. He is married to a Mexican woman and they have a beautiful family. I didn't wish to leave my mom and my sisters alone, so we returned together. Alongside the struggle to survive, to return to the ruins of our home, I began my, I began my fight for human rights. And I have been fighting for 20 years. But my dear friends, my brothers and sisters, I am tired. I feel like I, like I am losing the battle. Of course, I am not alone in this fight. I am a part of a small group of incredibly brave individuals in Prieto. Over the last two decades, I have become a political scientist, journalist, and a prominent and recognized human rights activist from Prieto area. And I have rebuilt our home. My fight began with collections, with, with the collection of people remains, the bones of people killed in their gardens and buried in numerous mass graves and for their honorable burials. My first duty after my return was to take care of one of eight cemeteries for the so far until today one, uh, 3,176 registered victims, innocent people from Priedorelia. A number that wasn't big enough for the court in The Hague to categorize the events that took place in Priedor as a genocide. Of the 3,176 killed, 256 of them have been women and 102 of them children. On the 23rd of July only, it was later discovered that only in one Thursday, in Maizetsov and Charako, in only two hours, 263 innocent civilians were killed, including men, women and children. I found my father's remains in a well in front of the house where he, along with four of his friends, were killed. And I immediately recognized him. His bones were in my jumper. Uh, he wore that morning when he went to work in the fields. And I made a promise to him then that I would look after my mother and sisters. And I hope that he is proud of his son today. In my fighting and struggle, I have faced many obstacles and misunderstandings, especially in the circles of the international community, the European Union and the United States of America. It seems to me that the last pieces of what is a modern European democracy is being destroyed in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, in Bosnia, human rights are not respected, especially the rights of victims and their families. For example, in Ternopolia concentration camp, where they were tortured and killed, 
including members of my family. A monument stands in honor of the fallen Serbian soldiers. Imagine a monument to a Nazi soldiers somewhere in Auschwitz or Dachau. After the Holocaust, we swore that such things would never be allowed to happen again. We repeated never, never again for millions of times. However, we again witnessed concentration camps and mass graves in the heart of Europe at the end of 20th century in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The sites of the camps and mass graves remain unmarked, with no monuments to honor the innocent people killed simply because they were different. Remembering them in the Republic of Srpska is officially forbidden. And, my dear friends, Omerska concentration camp is now owned by, by the British company ArcelorMittal Steel. And every year we need to put in a request to the management of the company to be allowed entry into the former camp only for two hours to pay respect and tributes to the murdered members of our families. Omerska concentration camp, as mentioned by the Jewish uh, communities in the United States of America, is nothing than echo of Auschwitz. And I don't know how many of you know that the ArcelorMittal orbit that stands in front of the Olympic Stadium creation of famous British artist Anish Kapoor was built for the 2012 Olympic Games. The sculpture is made with steel and materials from Omarska, an area covered with ma in the mass graves. And this is our memorial in exile, actually, in the United Kingdom. And I want to finish my speech with an appeal to the British government to help us as one of the guarantors of the 1995 Dayton Peace Agreement signed after the Srebrenica genocide in which over 8,000 primarily men and boys were systematically killed. To help us to stop this agony that all citizens of my country are facing so that we can finally live in safety like all normal people in Europe. To help to stop the discrimination we are facing and to help in the prevention of any new conflicts arising. Because, my friends, that what is happening now in my homeland is nothing but the last e-tape of genocide, which, in addition to the physical disappearance of Bosniaks and all other non-Serbs from the Serbian part of my homeland is accompanied by discrimination and denial of genocide, but also a horrible and aggressive anti-Bosnian policy. And what I want for my fellow citizens is nothing more than what today British society adores. Because I love them all, regardless of their national, religious, or any other orientation. Bosniaks, Serbs, Croats, as well Jews, Roma, and all other citizens of my beautiful country, or Bosnia Herzegovina. And at the end, I appeal to each of you tonight with the words of which our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said on his last Hajj, let the present present to the absent. And thank you for your attention. May God bless you all.
Okay, I'm going to invite uh, both Sibbin and uh, Amil to come and join us uh, up on the stage for a, for a short panel discussion. Uh, Sibbin and Amil, please.
But as you, as you can see, when, uh, when you're doing sort of amateur productions, everybody has to do a bit of everything, uh, including stage management. And firstly, I mean, Sidlin, thank you ever so much for, for coming here tonight um, and for, for sharing your story with us. Um, I mean, I, I could tell that there's an awful lot of pent-up emotion there for you. And what, what is it, I mean, given that all of this happened to you sort of over two decades ago, many people would say that you'd want to sort of put that out of your mind altogether to move on, to forget about it. And yet, I mean, you've, you've travelled sort of the, to the other side of Europe to come and sort of retell that story tonight. What, what makes you want to do that? First of all, I would like to express my gratitude for your attention and your applause standing ovation. And uh, please uh, be free to correct me. My English is not perfect. And it's I, far better than my uh, last name, I can tell you. You know, I'm actually German-speaking persons, and tonight I am a little bit devastated. I wasn't prepared for a speech to Yesterday night I was in uh, uh, Newcastle, since Saturday I started to hate this young man, today I hate him so much. <laughs> and uh, um, as a German speaking person at the other side as someone who is returning into the Republic of Srpska, the, the, the small group of people, Norman's people, last Mohicans, who are fighting for all those values, guys, you have here. Uh, I am here. I am volunteer. I am jobless, discriminated. I am just many... Uh, some of people from Bosnia like to tell that I am clever. I don't believe them. <laughs> and that I am political scientist, journalist. And... Yesterday, guys, I met one of my school friends in Newcastle and we cried for an hour and we started to talk about all our school friends we lost. They are actually my main motivation to be here tonight to speak in the name of those who are uh, since 1992 quiet forever. And they, they have been killed due to, just because of their ethnicity. They, have been Bosniaks, Muslims with big M at the time, but they have been Muslims. At the end, we are, our beauty ourselves are Islamic, but they were also as me, as I, sport, sportmen, musicians, Nirvana fans, football players ordinary normal people at the end of 20th century who have been killed and tortured in such a brutal way. So that's because I'm, I'm here tonight and they are actually my main motivation. And my other, uh, at the, uh, as a second motivation is I want to stay in Bosnia. I don't want to get out from my country. It's my country. It's my homeland. I lost my house, I lost my father, I lost 44 of my family members. I don't have neighbors anymore and, I've, and I'm fighting to stay there. Even I am since a couple of years asking myself, what am I doing, my God? It looks like the economy of uh, Germany grew it so much that they can also uh, have this luxus to ethnically clean my country from one day to another every, every single Bosniak from Republika Srpska can actually go to Germany start to work, start to go to the school it's strange it smells again on fire and I am someone who decided to stay there together with my mom, with my two sisters. Uh, and I will never allow to anybody to kill me that way uh, as 
my father has been killed. And I, I, I forgot to t tell you that I am from one non-communistic family. We are Islamic on our Bosnian way. I am Muslim, alhamdulillah. But my father was pro-Yugoslavian orientated. You know, many Bosnians loved Tito so much. And as a 12th child in a family at the time, in 1951, he becomes a Tito's godson. And could you imagine how it was for my father when Yugoslavia started to uh, disappear and how it was for my father uh, the, uh, that, and to feel that fear for, for us, for, for his family. Okay, thank you. And uh, of course, um, if, you, if you've got questions that you want to put to our panelists, um, if you put your hands up, and I was going to say I'll, I'll sort of take maybe a couple of questions at a time, otherwise I mean, I'm, I've got sort of one or two things that I want to ask um, both Amil and, uh, and Sipin about. Um, also, just to mention, um, if you're on social media, um, we are um, both Remembering Srebrenica and City Circle are on both Twitter and Instagram. Um, City Circle is at the City Circle. Um, remembering Srebrenica is uh, at Srebrenica UK. Um, so do feel free to, to tweet, tweet your thoughts and uh, tweet and post your Instagram, whatever it is that you do on Instagram. Um, share, your, share your photos and let other people who aren't here tonight know about what's, uh, what's being discussed. Um, Emil, um, I think one of the things that I sometimes get asked, and I don't know if I've got a very good answer to it, is from people who will say, well, okay, yes, what happened in Bosnia was, was terrible, but it's a long time ago. Why, and why do you focus in particular on what happened in one particular village in sort of one, one country in Europe that's um, sort of a thousand miles away or a couple of thousand miles away, when there are so many conflicts and so many um, sort of strifes going on in other parts of the world here today? Why, wh what's your answer to that question? Yeah, I, I mean, I touched briefly on that when I um, spoke earlier. Um, and the fact is, actually, there's since the Holocaust, which of course is a massive stain on our conscience, there's been one recognised genocide on European soil, and that one recognised genocide is in Srebrenica. And in actual fact, when you sort of delve further into it, like many of the questions that you receive, you know, my knowledge of Bosnia <laughs> wasn't very strong prior to going there. But when you go there, you realise it's not as far away as you think it is. It's a less, you know, it's about an hour's flight from Munich, it's an hour's flight from Vienna. There's many of us in this room who are actually alive at the time. Um, when you say, sort of, you know, this isn't something that happened like in, in ancient history, this is something that happened in the course of all our lifetimes. And there's many different ways you can say those those who, and when I address different people, for example, I addressed um, as part of the We Are One football tournament. Um, obviously, a lot of football sports there, but you know, do you remember the Manchester United football teams that had Ryan Giggs, that had David Beckham, that had Paul Scholes in their prime when Alan Hansen went on Match of the Day and said, You famously can't win anything with the kids? Well, that was in 1995. And when you contextualize it like that, it actually begins to actually people say, How? That is the question they ask when you actually explain to them. Is that in actual fact it didn't happen that long ago? It didn't happen in a <coughs> civilization or a country that's so dissimilar from us. Um, so that's why I think when, you know, when people, and that's like the role of membership in place, Ben, is that because there's so much lack of understanding and awareness, understandably, because many people just don't know that much about it because we don't emphasize it, it's not on our curriculum. In terms of the attention it receives, even now, despite the fact I've outlined the number of activities and events we hold, there's still some people, if I'm wearing my pin badge and I'll go to the tube station, they'll ask me, why are you wearing that? And I say, it's to commemorate seven minutes, and they look at you and say, what? What's that? How do you say it? Um, so there's still a lot to be done. Um, so that like, emphasizes that we can't, you know, whilst we have done an amazing amount in such a short period of time, it very much still is a work in progress because there's so much that's needed. And finally, you mentioned then is that there are things that are going on in the world as we speak, the way that certain groups are being treated. And once again, you know, we are aware of what's happening, but there's been a lack of intervention, and I therefore think that what's happening in Srebrenica plays an important part in that, because Srebrenica shows what happens when you allow hatred to flourish. It reaches, 
you know, a stage that has devastating consequences. Yet, if you look at what's happening across the world today, you know, I don't have to point out where these places are. There are events occurring which are alarmingly similar to what's happening, and therefore, I think, you know, one of the things that this organisation tries and, you know, not, not just to people, but, you know, we were in Parliament on Tuesdays to our, those in power to say that, you know, we do have a moral responsibility, we do have a moral obligation, because ultimately if we don't do anything, then nobody will. And the consequences will be tragic because people who are, you know, done nothing wrong will, will lose their lives just because they are the victims of unimaginable hatred. Okay. Um, I know Remembrance Srebrenica's theme this year is Bridging the Divide, and that was, uh, that was the, uh, the strap line that we used to, to publicise tonight's concert. I, I sort of know where, where you're coming from, the idea that we need to sort of bridge divides between communities, but I mean, many people will say that what happened in, what happened in Bosnia is a million miles away, not, I don't mean geographically, but a million miles away from any kind of inter-community tensions or dissatisfaction that you might see in a country like the UK or anywhere else in Western Europe. Um, Sophie, can you just tell us a, a little bit about, I mean, prior to, prior to the outbreak of war in, in Bosnia, uh, how, how great were the tensions between the, the, the Bosniak and the, the Serb community in, in, your, in your area? Uh, we actually haven't been prepared for something like this. It's, it was actually it, it was it happened quickly. You know, you have uh, independence of Slovenia, which always been has been independent. Somehow, we in Bosnia we like to to tell something like "Don't be Slovenian." It was always used. Uh, and then you have, we have a declaration of independence of Croatia. And uh, at, the, at this time, we started to feel uh, that something is going on. And uh, those who don't know where Prijedor is, we are in the northern western part of Bosnia-Herzegovina, very close to the Croatian border. It, and it was possible to hear uh, people fighting behind Kozara mountain and it was also possible to see volunteers, Serbian fighters going and coming back and shooting with Kalashnikov like we are here, threatening us. And, and how, how long was this at the very start of the war? And, but before? let me tell you something, my father didn't want to believe until he was, I, I, I'm probably sure that he was sure that he is not going to be killed. It is, and what is important to tell you tonight, guys, we have new, a defin, new definition of uh, genocide, actually, after Bosnia. International community, just because of they tried to wash their hands, they declared Srebrenica and Zrepa as a UN safe zones, and they left them to the, to the General Radko Mladic, the most notorious war criminal and an evil to kill them. But it is impossible to put a genocide into the borders of one small municipality. We had a conflict, we had a dissolution of Yugoslavia, we had a decision of Serbian authorities in Bosnia-Herzegovina to declare a part of Bosnia helped by the side of Yugoslav people army as their part of Bosnia, and then you have a famous assembly of, um, uh, it was at, in, in May uh, 1992, when they decided to kill all of us, not only in Srebrenica. They decided to have ethnically clean their part of Bosnia. That is genocide. Behind all genocides, is a system, is a state, is something parastate or whatever. It was organized, well planned uh, destruction of one part of population due to their ethnicity. Any just sort of final thoughts from, from you? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you've obviously had the like, privilege to hear your testimony from Sudbin, and the one thing, the one message I would say to you, like after that, is never underestimate the impact that you can make moving forward when it comes to sort of raising awareness. In the name of God, the compassionate and merciful, my Lord, do not let success deceive me or defeat drive me to despair. Keep reminding me that failure is temptation that precedes success. My Lord, teach me that tolerance is the highest degree of strength and that desire for revenge is the first sign of weakness. My Lord, if you deprive me of my property, leave me hope. If you grant me a success, grant me the willpower to overcome the defeat. And if you take away the blessing of health, grant me the blessing of faith. My Lord, when I sin against people, grant me the power to ask for forgiveness. And when people harm me, grant me the power to forgive. My Lord, if I forget you, do not forget me. Amen.